everyone! Welcome to episode number 606 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. I am super happy to have Brandon Bourne from Xenode on my podcast this week. Brandon and I are talking about the interesting intersection between AI and hardware design, and how Xenode is looking to revolutionize hardware design with their AI-enhanced electronic component search engine. Also this week, I check out a new kind of biohybrid robot developed by Cornell University that are controlled by mushrooms. Yes. You heard me right, mushrooms. So, before all that fungi business, please welcome Brandon to Fish Fry. Hi, Brandon. Thank you so much for joining me. Hi, Amelia. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so first off, tell me about Xenode. So, Xenode is a search engine for electronic components. We're using various AI models like LLMs to help users find and use the microprocessors, power supplies, resistors, et cetera, that work best for their circuit designs. All right. So, Brandon, what was the motivation behind its creation? Our motivation is pretty straightforward. We built the thing that we want for ourselves. My co-founder, Colin, and I are both electronic engineers that have designed and manufactured hundreds of different printed circuit boards over the years. So we're highly aware of all the pain points and monotonous repetitive tasks that exist across the whole process. So when ChatGPT launched and we all learned basically overnight what large language models or LLMs could do, we realized what a huge opportunity they offered for electronics design. How so? Well, LLMs have two things that no other previous algorithm could do. They can read large amounts of unstructured data and they can write coherent responses based on that data, what my co-founder Colin refers to as fuzzy search and talking parrot. The talking parrot is what ChatGPT is. It generates responses based on your inputs. And while that's really cool, it's also super prone to errors and hallucinations. In a field like electronics design, even a single mistake can cost tens of thousands of dollars. So that's not really acceptable. But the fuzzy search side of LLMs, that's super interesting because it can actually read the data sheet that is the instruction manual or source of truth that we engineers are referring to at every stage of the design and manufacturing process. Reading this is super hard, even for a human. They're 10 to 1,000 pages long. There are tens of millions of them. Every manufacturer is using different sections, formats, variable names. This was impossible before LLMs. Heck, even with LLMs, it took us a year to be able to do this and multiple different types of algorithms. But now it's built. And we've indexed over 10 million components. And we have the first ever AI-powered component search engine. That is fantastic. Now, Brandon... Why did you start with search? Out of the hundreds of boards we built, component selection is not only the first step, but one you have to do constantly throughout the entire design. And the only tools available today are Control-F in Adobe Reader and the filters on part catalogs that haven't really been updated in 10 to 20 years. So if today I'm trying to find like an accelerometer, I would go to the part catalog, which are hosted by distributors and manufacturers. I type in accelerometer filter down the 1,500 options by whatever specs I happen to know already. Then I'd get overwhelmed at the 400 remaining options and just start opening and reading data sheets at random until I give up and pick the one that I think is going to work. Obviously, this is super uncomfortable in an industry that doesn't allow mistakes. On the last board I built, I spent like a third of my time just picking the components. And I made a mistake on one of the 62 that I selected, and it cost us an $8,000 respin and a week's worth of engineering downtime. So nobody was really happy with me. So we used the AI to build a search engine because it's the first part of the design process. And right now it's super hard and very uncomfortable for engineers. Brandon, how does Xenode work? To start with, users can come in and search for exactly what they're looking for. So instead of just typing in accelerometers, I could say I'm looking for a five volt input accelerometer that doesn't draw a lot of power and has a configurable threshold interrupt for medical device. This is obviously a lot of information. And Xenode's AI goes into the part database, grabs all the accelerometers, sets the parametric filter on input voltage to 5 volts. Then it looks at the remaining results and ranks them by the rest of the information you gave it. So it'll prioritize the parts with low power input, threshold interrupts, and any applicable certifications for medical devices. 
that's already a hundred times better than the current process, but we've actually built more functionality on top of that. So even after all of that, there's still hundreds of potential accelerometers. And I don't know anything further about what I actually want. So I'd be opening data sheets at random and reading them to move forward, which totally defeats the purpose of an AI assistant. So what we did was we built a recommendations algorithm that extrapolates the unique groups out of the remaining results, and it'll display an example part from each. So instead of opening them at random, I can read data sheets that actually represent different options. And when I'm done, I can mark those as relevant or not relevant. And Zenode will re-rank the remaining results to prefer or avoid components similar to that one. So at the end of the day, my top result is probably the best one for my use case after I've done this a couple of times. Another thing that we've done is we've actually made the data sheets interactive. So when you're on a part page reading the data sheet, you can actually ask questions and the AI will generate a response to your question and it will highlight the source information within the data sheet, which is basically control F on steroids. That is super cool. So Zenode has caught the attention of many industry veterans. Talk to me about how you feel Zenode could revolutionize hardware design as we know it. Yeah, we got backing from the founders of SolidWorks, Onshape, Fitbit, Lockatron, executives from GradCab, Stratasys, and, and more. It was super interesting talking to these folks because we're all looking at AI as the next evolution of hardware design tools. I actually started my career at Autodesk as one of the first sales engineers on Fusion 360 in the era when MakerBot hit the market. And all of a sudden, for three grand, I had my very own 3D printer. And within a few years, there was like a Cambrian explosion of new products hitting the market. All of a sudden, I could 3D print a metal or buy a desktop CNC, do my own injection molds, like whatever I wanted. These are all hardware revolutions. But from a software standpoint, the industry really hasn't moved all that much. I mean, the PC revolution in the 80s was massive. That was the birth of modern hardware development, moving us off of drafting tables. But the internet revolution in the 90s, the mobile revolution in the 2000s, Web3 and cloud in the 2010s, like what really stuck? Like I still use CAD software that's native on my PC. And yeah, it stores in the cloud, but I'd never dream of using a mobile device. So AI is the first software revolution that's truly disruptive for hardware development. Hate to use that word, but it is. In talking to our investors, they were all the leading participants in previous eras. So AI's got huge potential, but it needs to follow the same process. It needs to be familiar, it needs to be stable, and above all, it needs to be accurate. Hardware is a highly conservative industry because we've all been burned. Everyone has made mistakes that cost thousands and thousands of dollars and weeks of time. I'm not alone. And I'm certainly not going to trust a computer to do that unless I'm in the driver's seat. Absolutely. Now, what does the future look like for you guys? We're going to be working on accuracy for the lifetime of this company. (laughs) We'd love to get to the point where AI and LLMs can be trusted 99.9% of the time. And we think that's table stakes for anything else. Once we've gotten to that point, I mean, even before that point, we can do things like crosses and we can help review circuit designs and schematics. There's a lot that we can help do. But when we've gotten to 99% accuracy, there's so many tedious, monotonous tasks that just plague hardware development. I mean, like I didn't become an electrical engineer to spend my time making footprints for components, but the circuit doesn't work until I do. I don't want to tweak reference designs. I don't want to spend my time moving around vias and tra- like thousands of vias and traces. That was so fun today. Can't tell you how, <laughs> how much I enjoyed that. I don't want to review designs by printing them out and marking them up with a red Sharpie. Or, you know, obviously we don't want to sift through part data sheets looking for tiny details. These are not value add. They're just unfortunately necessary. And long-term, we don't believe AI or even AGI will replace engineers any more than the invention of CNC replaced machinists. In fact, I think there's like three times more machinists today than there was at the peak of World War II. Just like CNC, artificial intelligence is just another tool in the engineering toolbox, abstracting us to do higher level work just a lot faster. The most exciting things in our future are fusion energy, space elevators, anti-aging treatments, brain implants, all of these sci-fi technologies that we've dreamed of and been promised since, you know, Heinlein wrote his first book. And all of this requires moving physical atoms around. Software is only going to get you so far. So yeah, we believe that AI is the tool of the future, the same way the wheel, the printing press, and the transistor were before it. All of these improvements unlocked tremendous opportunities in hardware development, and ultimately they provide a benefit for all mankind. I love it. All right, Brandon, it is time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? 
I'm really not much of a foodie, like typical founder type. I would inject Soylent if it made any sense to do that. <laughs> but if I had to pick one, it would probably be Pad Thai. And while that's super bland and boring, and I'm sure everybody's going to judge me for it. Like the last time we visited Thailand, everyone was making fun of me because I ordered it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's just like, it's such a great comfort food. That is a great answer. No, I, that's an absolutely valid answer. <laughs> Well, Brandon, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Amelia. Always great to chat with you. Have you heard about the new robots that are powered by mushrooms? And no, this is not a storyline of an upcoming sci-fi movie. Get this. A team of researchers at Cornell University insist that the fungal kingdom could provide environmental sensing and command signals to robots to improve their levels of autonomy. Okay, so how exactly? Well, these researchers from Cornell have found a way to control new biohybrid robots by harnessing the electrical signals of fungal mycelia, which are the underground vegetative parts of mushrooms. The cool part about fungal mycelia is that it has the ability to sense biological and chemical signs and can also respond to multiple inputs. Fungal mycelia may give biohybrid robots the ability to respond to their environment better than their synthetic counterparts. Adnan Mishra, a research associate in the organic robotics lab at Cornell, who is part of this research study, explains it like this. If you think about a synthetic system, let's say any passive sensor, we use it for just one purpose. But living systems respond to touch, they respond to light, they respond to heat, they respond to even some unknowns like signals. That's why we think, okay, if you wanted to build future robots, how can they work in an unexpected environment? We can leverage these living systems and any unknown input that comes in, and the robot will respond to that. Okay, so merging the worlds of robotics and mushrooms isn't just about being tech savvy and having a green thumb. Mishra explains the challenge like this. You have to have a background in mechanical engineering, electronics, some mycology, some neurobiology, some kind of signal processing. All of these fields must come together to build this kind of system. So Mishra brought together a range of interdisciplinary researchers, including a research associate in neurobiology and behavior, to better understand how to record the electrical signals that were carried in the neuron-like iconic channels in the mycelia membrane, and an associate professor of plant pathology and plant microbiology who taught Mishra how to grow clean mycelia cultures because contamination can be a big challenge when you're sticking electrodes in fungus. <laughs> Mishra himself developed a system that includes an electrical interface that blocks electromagnetic interference and vibration to accurately record and process the electrophysiological activity of the mycelia in real time. Basically, Mishra's system reads the raw electrical signal, processes it, and then identifies the mycelia's rhythmic spikes, and then converts that information into a digital control signal, which is then sent to the robot's actuators. So Mishra and his team from Cornell built two different robots, a wheeled robot and one shaped like a spider who participated in three different experiments. In the first experiment, these robots rolled and walked respectively as a response to the natural continuous spikes of the mycelia signal. In the second experiment, this team stimulated the robots with ultraviolet light 
And interestingly, this light caused the robots to change their gates, which indicates the mycelia's ability to react to their environment. And in the third experiment, this team was also able to override the mycelia's native signal entirely. Mishra explains the importance of this research like this. This kind of project isn't just about controlling a robot. It is also about creating a true connection with the living system. Because once you hear the signal, you also understand what's going on. Maybe that signal is coming from some kind of stresses. So you're seeing the physical response because those signals we can't visualize. But the robot is making the visualization. So other than creating robots powered by mushrooms, which is absolutely cool, where is this kind of biorobotics headed in the future? Rob Shepard, professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering at Cornell and the Associated Research Papers senior author, explains the future of this research like this. By growing mycelium into the electronics of a robot, we are able to allow the biohybrid machine to sense and respond to the environment. In this case, we use light as an input, but in the future, it will be chemical. The potential for future robots could be to sense soil chemistry in row crops and decide when to add more fertilizer, for example perhaps mitigating downstream effects of agriculture like harmful algae blooms. Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about these fungus-controlled robots, or if you want to check out the fantastic abilities of the Zenode platform yourself, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And folks, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me and our new animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of November 1st, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>